up very briefly. This is the FBI memo concerning James Spencer, not to be confused with landlord John Spencer. James Spencer was a uh, this time unemployed car salesman, but he was employed from February to August 1961 at Dumas Milner Chevrolet Company. Now, February to August 1961 happens to be a time when Lee Oswald is in Russia, as everybody knows. But it's also a time when Kerry Thorne is in New Orleans. Spencer advised that an individual who identified himself as Lee Oswald, and here's one of the most curious things in the case so far, with the address Magazine Street, attempted to purchase a car through him at the Dumas Milner Chevrolet. Uh, he does not recall the date, but he does recall that he was employed there from February to August 61. He states that Oswald impressed him with the characters, spoke favorably of Cuba, appeared to be enthusiastic about Castro. It, uh, it's, it's a routine like it could have been Oswald, except it's uh, in the spring of 61 when Thornley is here and not Oswald. Do we have any uh, indication of where Thornley was living in 61? We have... Um, um, in the original Thornley file, I have not only a breakdown of, of his residences, I think, uh, which I made after the grand jury testimony, I had him go through every place he lived, but every place he worked. If I could somehow find that, if we could get the grand jury testimony, it would be useful. Because, uh, just remember, one of the places for a while was uh, Fox... Uh, a film company. Another place was uh, as, a, as a waiter or bus boy at the St. Charles Hotel. He moved around uh, almost like Larry Crayford moved around the country, except he's staying in the New Orleans area. But anyway, this uh, identifies the memo sufficiently. Um, it's the kind of thing that, that you have to read to, to appreciate. Uh, one more point. Um, the FBI agent writing it says, a few days ago, while Spencer was looking through his billboard billfold, he found a business card which he'd used while employed as a salesman by Dumas Milner in New Orleans. On the back of the card was a notation in his, Spencer's handwriting, Lee Oswald Magazine Street. Now, of course, this is the kind of thing that we've been encountering for a long time uh, at an early stage. And in, the, uh, uh, in our investigations, but uh, somewhere along the line, I think uh, it became apparent to us that uh, this was too consistent to, uh, to be a mistake. Uh, the, this also occurs with regard to Bolt and Ford. Uh, the name Lee Oswald is used in 62, and it also occurs again with regard to and the rest out on the lakefront. I guess I'll come across that which occurs in 62 or 61. Now, we know Oswald is in Russia then, but that's not the point any longer. The, the approach of the Federal Bureau of Investigation was to say Oswald is in Russia, therefore this is irrelevant. Uh, and, uh, I'm suggesting that uh, a more productive approach is this is too systematic to be a mistake in uh, memory here or there someone in New Orleans in 61 and 62 is using Lee Oswald's name. On to the next point. And I might add, I, I think the leading candidate for the reasons given would be Kerry Thornley. Incidentally, um, we know that uh, this, there would be at least two people in the uh, that quasi intelligence substructure uh, connected with the uh, Cubans and Bannister, um, who in 19... One would be Gary Thornley. They were in the same CAP unit, something we established a long time ago uh, after extensive effort. I might add that a possible third one could be Clay Shaw because he used to hang around at a homosexual bar uh, on Exchange Place, which was across the street from where Oswald lived when he went to high school, but we have never been able to establish that they met. In any case, Ferry and 
Thornley and 61 are here in no honest We have, oh, here's another one you may not have. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, here's another one. Before you go, you may not have this on your list, uh, but... Uh, I'll be back in uh, 25 minutes and come to pick up something. Do you have John Becker, the, the, the uh, two Cubans and the Americans coming into the traffic division? Yeah. Can you get a parade for Yeah, I we got that. No, I mean on your, uh, on the chronological list. No. Well, that's what I'm saying, that we've got, we're going to have more and more things to add. I just mentioning in passing. This, uh, the time place for this incident is March 1962. We're working, in, we're, we're, we're working out a chronological uh, listing of the appearances of individuals using the name of the hospital while they're still in Russia, and individuals subsequently who apparently are not a hospital, but are playing hospital uh, in scenarios after they get back. And uh, we might find a time pattern uh, which, uh, in which uh, the existence of certain times or certain gaps will be productive. Anyway, FBI memo, dated 11-30-63. Uh, John Becker advised, as you recall, two Cubans and an American coming into the traffic division while he was in charge for the purpose of securing a parade permit. He placed the time of this incident as being in March 1962. In March 1962, uh, Lee Oswald is still in Dallas. You coming back? Okay. He's still in Dallas, Texas. Uh, he doesn't come to New Orleans until the following month. So again, this is a possible Carrie Thornley item, and uh, that's uh, a good one to check out early. Okay, mm -hmm. because in a case like one of these, one of the good possibilities, uh, uh, parenthetically, one of the good possibilities about these 1961 and 1962 items, when Oswald was not here, is the individuals uh, who are being interviewed uh, probably have not acquired that false conviction that it was Oswald. For example, uh, when you get to Dallas just before the assassination and you have uh, somebody shooting on your reins with a man like a Carcano and you've been telling people uh, for 14 years that uh, uh, Lee Oswald was using your reins and, and if it actually turned out to be a Carrie Thornley, uh, an awful lot of people would really be disappointed to find out it wasn't Oswald. Besides, they would have convinced themselves by rote and repetition. Uh, but in a case like this, one ordinary FBI agent, uh, well, certainly in the case of 61, would tell him Oswald was not in the country in 61, so he wouldn't have acquired the fixation, and uh, I'm suggesting it would be freer to look at a picture and see if it might be Thornley. The people you talk to in Dallas when that time comes, some of them are going to have a fixation that it was Oswald, even though it wasn't, uh, it couldn't have been downtown Lincoln, it couldn't have been the shooting range. But, but by now, some people will be convinced it was. They rewrite their own history just like the government does. But I think we have a better shot at getting a identification of the false Oswald in these 1961-62 cases. Mr. Becker stated that he had seen photographs of Lee Harvey Oswald, and although he saw the individuals who applied for the permit, he could not say that one of them had been Oswald. Now, that's a good witness. That's the kind you want to see. Kind of got possibilities. That's uh, that's the priority item. Well, the multiple. Yeah. Cliff, you see that pattern of uh, they're using Oswald's name? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, people connected with the Cubans and the Bannister operation, uh, uh, which is another way of saying this intelligence or semi-intelligent substructure that is servicing the anti-Castro effort are using Oswald's name even though he's in Russia. And we know of only two people uh, for sure who are in New Orleans in 61 and early 62 who know the name Lee Oswald. And one is Kerry Thornley and the other is David Ferry and both of them are quite a 
apparently connected with this uh, semi-intelligent substructure, uh, whatever it may turn out to be. FBI memo dated 11-30-63, same date, again about the parade permit, but uh, this is another person. This is an officer named Captain Wilfred Rusich. And uh, after the arrest of Oswald in Dallas, after the assassination, the memo says, he was called an individual genuinely, generally fitting the facial characteristics of Oswald, had been in the traffic division, which, which is uh, Tulane and Broad, a part of the uh, police department here, with some Cubans to apply for a permit to parade. Captain Grusich uh, stated, to go back down to the point, as best as he can recall, sometime in March 1962, three individuals came for the permit. So he confirms the uh, general statement of Becker. It is two Cubans plus somebody um, who's uh, a non-Cuban. And... Uh, the Cuban spoke very little English. The third individual was an American who acted as the spokesman. Again, in March 1962, Oswald is not yet in New Orleans, but Carrie Thornley is, and that will be checked out. There's another man at the bottom, a, an additional witness, if I didn't point it out before, I might call your attention out there. It says, so Captain Grusich said he had discussed this incident with Sergeant George De Duel, who was assigned to the traffic division. And De Duel, or whatever it is, felt that he had also seen either Oswald or someone who closely resembled him in the traffic division attempting to secure a parade permit. So now we have a third witness there, which is pretty good, especially with two of them as uh, uh, police officers because they're more likely to to remember faces, but now we have three witnesses uh, about the American with the two Cubans in March 62. So that is worth an early check out. Dito's still on the police department, Bruce is from the Thai captain. Oh, good. So Start off with Dito, but that, that's, a, that's a hell of a good beginning. But anyway, the point is, Cliff, that pattern is too strong to be an accident. That's, uh, we just hit this the other day. I've forgotten about that. We picked that up years ago. But, uh, it even gets stronger later with Bolton Ford. Um, here's one more item I might mention. That Grusich has shown a photograph of Lee Oswald taken August 1963 by the New Orleans Police Department. That's when he was arrested. Uh, why the hell does the date August 10th suddenly become important? It was a phone call somebody made on August 10th. I came across it the other night and I was trying to let me write something down to myself here. Huh? No, uh, no, that's a June 10th phone call. It's, uh, it's uh, Jack Ruby's two calls to Fort Worth. I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking about something on August 10th that uh, I came across in reading uh, someone else, uh, Thornley or somebody. Um, Oswald's arrested on, uh, on the 9th. And uh, I was trying to... Incidentally, <coughs> mentioning Carrie Thornley, Excuse we don't... When was that incident? Which incident? Oh, you mean the, uh, the uh, permits? The permits, the, the attempt uh, to get a permit was in March 62. Thornley was arrested in... Thornley was arrested in August of 62. That's what I was about to get to that. That's something that we forgot to go in, into in front of John. And, and, and we, we'll include it. Uh, well, he's, we'll include it now. <coughs> yeah. We'll go into that as soon as I finish this one last uh, sentence of this current usage. Grusich was shown, uh, just so you can get the, the, this line, Grusich was shown a photograph of Leo Oswald taken August 9th when he was arrested in 63. Captain Grusich stated that although he still felt that Oswald had been the one he was referring to 
as having been there with the Cubans, he could not state this to be a fact. So he has an open mind as to who the young American male was, and uh, it's just as well since Otto was still in Dallas in March. Now, I've just been talking with uh, with uh, Gaten about another incident which occurred in 1962. In this case, it's not an unidentified person, uh, but it is Kerry Thornley who was arrested on the 13th of August, 1962. And the way this developed was, um, I think, uh, largely by phone. But I, I sent Gaten a 50-page gratuitous um, affidavit of Thornley along with my analysis, and he agreed with me that uh, Thornley had bumped into far too many people and uh, was not now no longer Joe Smith. And uh, so uh, I, uh, and this stimulated my interest, I think, more than I made a B of I check, and damn if we didn't come up with an arrest for Kerry W. Thornley. Um, and he was living in the French Quarter. We do have his, uh, his address there, although I don't have it in the book in front of me. 1717. No, not 17. It's 717, isn't it? 717. Yeah, I'm sorry. 717 Barracks. And the charge, the charge that Thornley's arrested for while uh, Oswald's still in Russia is a fascinating charge, but it, it doesn't tell us all we want to know. It is violating a city ordinance by posting a leaflet or, or a post, putting a poster on a telephone post at three in the morning at the corner of uh, Governor Nichols and Royal or something like that. that area. You, you did a follow-up check on it, if you recall. I don't have it's in that know. area. It's Governor Nichols or something. But that, that's in the French Quarter. But the point is, um, you can almost smell the, the indication that uh, you've got to be down here and it's involved in, in anti-Castro activity. And here he is finally putting, he's got something in his hands with print on it, which would certainly be most useful to us. And he's putting it on the poster and he's arrested. And we, we locate the two arresting officers and they can't recall what's on the poster. They, they, they vaguely remember the arrest, but they cannot remember what was on the poster. So, unless... Uh, Perhaps you could give that to the LJ to follow up, because this is recent stuff, right? You just read, locating those two... Yeah, was, uh, Steve Bordelon talked to the... Uh, I'll have to locate it, but... Uh, the po Steve Bordelon talked to the arresting officers, and they couldn't remember a darn thing about what was on the poster, but I, I felt dissatisfied about that. Um, for this reason, um, I know that was a long time ago, and we're talking to them in 1977, asking them to remember what was on the poster in 1962, which is a pretty heavy of, of request. But on the other hand, this had to be an unusual situation because it is in the middle of the French Quarter at 3 o'clock in the morning. And uh, if he'd been arrested for being drunk, uh, an officer could not hardly remember that six months later because that happens so often in the quarter. But how often do you make an arrest for an ordinance that's so seldom violated as putting a poster on a telephone post? I'm just saying it's very unusual and you might uh, remember it at the end of your career because maybe it would only happen once. What about the affidavit? What about the affidavit? Well, we got, they don't have affidavits for, uh, uh, I'm just trying to think, the, uh, the system back then? The, I don't think they have affidavits for a minor ordinance. City ordinances. Uh, no, I, I sent for the affidavit, um, and they couldn't find it at, at municipal court, and apparently they didn't have one, but we found the arrest slip which the, probably what the judge makes his, uh, handles as an affidavit. Is that what they do with very minor ordinances now? Well, not, now they make an affidavit. But back then, the arrest slip would come in. Like, uh... And the arrest slip has the essentials on it. Right. As far as the judge is concerned. As far as the judge is concerned. 
Well, in other words, that was so minor that, uh, uh, hell, I don't even know if they had a, a, a trial. I can't remember. Did, he, did you call anything like $10? He was arrested for, for $15 for 15 days he was given. Hey, I know what we forgot to check out. We forgot to check out the judge. The arrest slip would not necessarily have the court uh, going to, because that's made out earlier. Um, and uh, some of those judges aren't geniuses, but uh, other judges out there are pretty damn bright. Who was uh, who was uh, the municipal judges in '62? I uh, uh, because this is unusual enough. A lawyer might remember uh, somebody in the middle of the night if there was an unusual legend on it. Especially if it related to the Cubans, and within a year, a man who is handing out fair play for Cuba, supposedly shoots the president, it might have triggered his memory. And, and if you have a bright lawyer like if Lou Trent, although he's primarily traffic, if he was sitting, uh, there's an excellent chance that one of the judges would have had their memory triggered by Oswald's activity if it were about Cubans. All right, we can check by back then and see by the time of arrest whose court it went to, because it went by Tom's. In other words, whatever time the arrest was made, that the arrest was, was that, made at three in the morning. All right, that would make that would make the section of court be night court. But who was there at sixty-two? Sixty-two was the old man. Uh, uh, Somebody who's undoubtedly dead now. I don't think he's dead. I don't think he died. He, uh, Glancy took this place. Uh, he's out of the bench at night. Uh, yeah, I got his name on the tip of my tongue. Can't take it. Not Harold person. Moore. He's been dead no, for no, years. No, no, no. Across the river. Oh, uh, the crazy judge. Yeah, it, the, he was crazy. He is, a bed bug. Uh, <laughs> oh, are you kidding? Oh, there's never been a judge like Babylon. Uh, Babylon. Babylon is. Babylon but you want to know what he's so crazy? He's so crazy he may remember that. Babylon is just the kind of guy who might remember that. There's no question because he's nuts. And I'm going to tell you something else we can check. Go back into the archives and get the property for him. They may have listed the evidence on property. Oh, you, you, that's great. You want to... What I'm thinking about is they may have taken the post and listed his evidence on property, brought it to the court. But it wouldn't take the telephone post. But you mean the... Uh, well, no, I'm going to the post there. Well, I don't know. It's, maybe you're out. <laughs> well, I would cut the post down. So look, they have things stuck on his post right here. Did you see that? Yeah? I, I think I Can't got call a me a liar. <laughs> <laughs> Can't call me a liar. It's a post. You know? No, but the idea does, I mean, the idea does strike me that they may have listed that as evidence on the property book and went to the court and turned the property over as evidence. I'll tell you. Court. Let me tell you. Because the poster would be evidence. Well, okay, why don't you stop and make some notes on it while we remember all this, because if we leave it up to me to, to remind you, I'm so overloaded with things now, but take my word for it. The importance of this, the potential importance is, is hard to describe. If this turns out to be a Cuban legend of some sort, well, it ties Thornley in all the more strongly with the intelligence structure which is servicing the anti-Castro activity. Um, and furthermore, Babylon is, uh, is ignorant for a judge, in a sense, but he's brighter than the average witness. And uh, Almost any judge out there, now that I talk it out, if there was anything about Cuban about that sign, it's it's only uh, a year later that Oswald's handing out fair play for Cuba pamphlets, and a few months after that you have the assassination, and a judge who handled an unusual case like uh, a sign about Cubans in the middle of the night 15 months before would have his memory jarred. I think we have an excellent chance of picking it up with the judge. And I'll tell you briefly about Babylon, just uh, it won't take more in a second. You you haven't had any judges like this in New York. But this, this guy is a great fisherman, and, and he's also fond of being a private detective. Maybe someday somebody can write a series of stories about a guy like He liked to solve a case. He used to like to solve. In other words, uh, uh, he was very racist, uh, very racist. I mean, he would make the average Mississippi uh, Mississippian look like he was uh, um, 
uh, a liberal from the, what, what's a real liberal out there? Oh, the liberal. In other words, he automatically told any black boy he could be 57 years old. I suppose a, a black lawyer, he would just uh, make an exception, but otherwise he'd say, uh, uh, Well, I, I don't you, have, you have a copy, don't you? Yeah. Okay, well, let me try. Let me, let me see if I can um, uh, make this uh, uh, more productive. For productive. Sake, you might want to point out the highlights. Of the okay. Uh, yeah. This was an important uh, the anecdote we didn't have time for, but uh, the stop on the arrest could be important. You're going to check that out. Yeah, I got, I got, I'll check for you. Okay, now here's a very important uh, sheet of paper. It's worth your looking at. Cliff, the Federal... Bureau of Investigation Report, Oscar W. De Lott. Looks like they slapped, but they call it De Lott down here. Now, as I read this to you, and I'm going to read this one because this is one of the most important things in the whole case we've built down here. But as I read this to you, keep in mind that we have... Oh, okay. Good, good. We have an even more detailed statement we got from another employee of Bolton Ford named Fred Sewell. So this is just one witness. We have it supported by several witnesses. But as I describe it, you'll see how it begins to tie things more and more together. Tie the Cubans, the Friends of Democratic Cuba, who started off in the Balta building with Bannister and then later evolved into the Cuban Revolutionary Front and end up in the Newman Building again with Guy Bannister. Only at the Newman Building, their address becomes 544 Camp and Bannister's around the corner. It's one of my great discoveries for which I'm sure the CIA is... Yeah, the, the, the progress of some kind. Uh, Bannister was the right. Let's, let's go on, because uh, the, here's the, this is important, what he, what he just brought in. Oh, incidentally, uh, he mentioned that he wanted, he said, did I have a file like this on, on Bannister? And I said, we just put together another light file, because it's, it's just temporary, it's not a complete, it's not everything we have. But we have, uh, somewhere around here, everybody has a copy of a Bannister file. But just to show him the operation. Yeah, he has one. The only thing that's missing that you would want to look at at the same time would be the index of Bannister's files. You, might look at that. you saw that. So you know it's not a private detective office. Definitely not. It's important for you to see that because otherwise you're just hearing me say, I don't think it's a private well, detective office. See, there's a reason that that's one of the main reasons of one of the things I'm very interested in. Uh, I was telling you, L.J., uh, the method of obtain all these files Away, you know. Absolutely. Some of those files, we want to see what's, uh, uh, now that you all could probably get them, I couldn't get anything. I'd either got to have some muscle or some, but, some but, but if Mary Bannister still has any, I'm sure that it, she'd probably be cooperative. The Crime Commission... I think she would be. I think she would. My, she she would. my memory of her is she's a pretty nice person. Uh, the, uh, I, I try and take an approach which does not indicate uh, an incrimination of Bannister. I think right. that's very important. Yeah. It is very important, and I wondered, I just wanted LJ to hear this in case he should be the one to end up communicating. It is very important that whoever communicates with Mary Bannister to see if she has any files left, because she may have some. Uh, handles it just right because there should not be an inference necessarily that, that it would be it would be inculpatory to her husband they, they would certainly they were split and so forth but uh, she's a, no, a normal woman she she would be reluctant to do anything that blackened his reputation I, I would suggest an approach be developed along the lines of uh, a, a man named Dave Ferry that uh, hung around uh, your husband's place has turned out to be very interesting. And fortunately, your husband uh, is, is, is happened to be more organized than the average fellow, which may be a great break for us, because we believe that in his files will be material that will be very useful. In other words, you could almost make her feel good about it. And in the final analysis, she's going after him anyway.
This is a very important one. Interview of one Fred Sewell. This is uh, another a guy in the Bolton Ford situation. I don't have to repeat it all, but uh, the only thing is, oh, listen to this. I haven't seen this for some time. Mr. Sewell went on to relate that the man who came in with Oswald had a scar over his left eye, that he didn't have a Spanish name, but that he was a Cuban type. Now, that would be a good one to show Frank Sturgis to. Well, my, my note on that is you can see his rebel. Well, I know, you're voting for Rebell, I'm voting for Sturgis, but I mean... Oh, okay. <laughs> huh? Well, be, well be, I know, I'm not talking about the name, it was Fiorini, but I'm saying apparently he didn't have his plastic surgery um, at the time that picture was taken. Let me see the picture. In other words, uh, this guy may not be the escort I thought he was earlier, but he could well turn out to be the one buying the trucks, is what I'm saying. And listen to this description. Uh, the man who came in with Oswald, who I believe is probably Thornley, because this is in 61, had a scar over his left eye, but he didn't have a Spanish name, but that he was a Cuban type. This is a picture uh, clip of Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In 1963, before the assassination, he had a scar on his left eye. But he, undoubtedly, he's not the only one in the world, so yeah. I don't want to get fixated on that, but I think he just ought to be checked out. Yeah, because the description. Well, you know better than me. I think you're right. You look more Italian. But, but, but in any case, that was originally what was of major interest to me when we first got this, but I think the way things have developed, this is more interesting now uh, with regard to the KT, the Thornley possibilities, because uh, again we have the Oswald business. The next page you see questioning by Jim Alcock, and uh, since he was one of the brighter lawyers in the office, uh, that'll take care of itself when you when you read it. But you will see that uh, they are here. This is, uh, this is even stronger. Uh, Fred Sewell, unlike the lot, remembers the full name of the man. And I met him at some point and recall him as an impressive person. The lot just remembered Oswald. Federal Fred Sewell says, I think that Oscar the lot wrote that on there, Lee Oswald wrote that on there, Lee Oswald, but he didn't use the Harvey, just Lee Oswald, if I remember right. Lee Oswald, yes, it's six years, of course, he represented himself as Lee Oswald. He's the man that spoke up and said, I'm the man handling the money, you ought to have my name, too. Well, whoever it is, it's somebody uh, more important than uh, uh, Tom Beckham, who is, I think, a hanger-on that wouldn't be doing anything that heavy. On the other hand, uh, um, looks to me like Thorne is more a uh, professional member of the club, and he might well be doing that. Let's see if we, on page four, uh, just to call your attention to it, Free Democrats of Cuba comes up again. He says uh, they're talking about uh, the Bolton Ford kind of contributing to the thing, giving him a good deal. Uh, and uh, somewhere in here, there's the inference that uh, it's uh, patriotic and uh, as it for the government. And Sewell also described the FBI coming in and picking up the bed with two pieces of plastic. Uh, so Oswald's name apparently was on it. And the rest of it, uh, you can go through at your leisure, the point is made. Now, now, well, here we come again, damn it. It's just, uh, we started off, when we first started kicking this around, sometime last year, gave them that, and, and this isn't the result of a, of a systematic checkout, because I haven't had a chance, but the way this has ballooned since you and I first talked is really remarkable. Here we are, uh, if you're looking at this interview with David Lusto, Levy Board Police Sergeant. You got that one? I should have it, man. I got the whole time. 
Okay, the point here is he starts off, he arrests a man who, this isn't, uh, this is a very, this is a supplementary uh, uh, memo, which uh, I better read uh, the other one first because this is a follow-up. Yeah, this is a follow-up six weeks later. And Chamber is very good, but this is just supplementary. So you should t look next at the John Doles interview on March 1st to have it in order. <coughs> do you have that? Yeah, which one do you have first? I should have an order. Amanda? Okay. Um, we'll leave the elevator. You want to lock the front door? No, the lock the front door. Isn't the lock coming back? Oh, that's right. Well, then, uh, why don't you lock this door? Just to, uh, no, then don't worry about it. All right, I'll just leave everything open. Okay. Bye -bye. See you later. Oh, thank you. Thank you for making a coffee. Let me, let me move ahead, okay? Uh, the John Bowles interview is interesting again because of the steady repetitiveness of uh, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald surfacing when uh, um, it doesn't seem to be the real Lee Oswald. Uh, and keep this in mind. If, with almost no investigative staff to speak of, myself and Chamber, as you know, this talk occasionally, both occasionally, and sometimes I've on almost no serious staff to speak of, and not concentrating on the times when I was in here. We're almost avoiding those initially because they kind of frustrate us. Uh, that's not what we're hunting for. We, like 61, we know I was in Russia. What are we going to do with that? But the point is, nevertheless, they keep flying in the, in the, in the damn window. And without a conscious effort to accumulate a structure, we've developed a structure of uh, repetitive appearances of uh, the name Lee Oswald when he isn't here. So what I'm getting to is if that happens without an effort on our part to, to go out and find them, think how many times they use the name Lee Oswald during 61 and 62 that we don't even know about yet. If we see this many without having gone out in the field to try. In other words, I didn't say go out. Oswald in Russia in 60, 61 and early 62, go out and see if you can find any instances of somebody using his name. That would be different. But we're not looking for that. But look how many we get anyway. What I'm saying is God knows how many other times they've done it. They must have been doing it all the time. It must have been kind of like a, an end joke for them. Maybe started by Barry but it's happening too often. Anyway, John Bowles' report is an interview with Charles Noto, who remembers arresting Lee Harvey Oswald, he thinks, in October or November of 62. Well, in October or November of 62, Oswald has just moved from Fort Worth to Dallas, and it is unlikely that he's in New Orleans. But anyway, uh, you have that uh, lakefront arrest and the next memo follows up so the main thing is there are other names mentioned also present other patrolmen superintendent other people that you can check out the next is a follow-up memo David Lusto and his his memo is of special value I would take a pen and do this uh, well, I underlined it. Just the underlined point is the whole thing. Lusto said, are you looking at Lusto? Yeah. Lusto said this could not have happened in 1962 because as he remembers it, it was in 1961. So once again, we have Oswald, in quotes, appearing when the real Oswald is in Russia. And uh, the next memo is Noto again with a few more details but uh, he's vague about the year but in any case it doesn't seem to be hard. So now we come to another case of a non oswald which you may not have on your list because the, yeah that's a much more comprehensive one that's a questioning by Alcott. That's a question of Alcott, by Alcott of Sewell, that follows, and that will be much more detailed. He remembers the name Lee Oswald. 
Anyway, Cliff, the next thing is an FBI memo about the Jones Printing Company, interview with Myra Silver. And uh, this is interesting because, again, it does not seem to check out to be the author. The, uh, she tells the Bureau that in May of 1963, uh, by which time we know that Oswald is here. Uh, a person she understood to give his name as Osborne appears at the Jones Printing Company and orders a thousand copies of a handbell in there. You see the handbell. He uh, comes with an escort, as you see, with a follow-up. Uh, the handbells were made up on June 1 and locked up on June 3rd, and she says Osborne as she remembers, it probably appeared on June 4th. Mrs. Silver, the important thing is underlined, was shown a photograph of Lee Harvey Oswald, at which time she stated she could not recognize the person in the picture as the person who placed the order for the handbells. So once again, we have the most interesting phenomenon in the case, I suppose, the way it continues to develop. It's much more than I... Uh, did you hand that to your list? The Jones Printing Company? Yeah, you got the I don't have Jones, but I got the number. I just don't have it on here. Okay. Yeah, but I'm going to only find the date. Of, what's the date of that? The date of that is, uh, Oswald's here, but she does, she can't identify his picture. And, uh, this is, uh, June 1963. 8677. She picks two as possible, so only an Oswald. Although she says the only space appears more full. I don't know which picture she was shown. <coughs> okay. Douglas Jones. We've had the moment of employee. was employed at Jones Printing Company. Now there's Douglas Jones, the owner. We'll have to hmm? give the second file. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm just happy to mark myself. <laughs> I asked Fraser to review his relationship with Carrie Thornley. That's the point here. Fraser said that he, Fraser, used to attend a discussion group on Friday nights at 514 Bourbon. The Ryder Coffee House is, uh, I'm pretty sure, on, on 700 Rampart, even though they don't seem to mention it this one. Um, some of the people who attended the discussions were Carrie Thornley, William Brady, Helen Gladstone, the close friend of Brady's, that were inside and lost Buckley. The person who held the discussion a man named I found homosexual. Frazier said Brady was also homosexual. Frazier said politics occupied the bulk of the discussions and Carrie Thorny was an active participant in the group. Frazier said that he was gone on a trip when Brady was picked up on a morals charge and later deported to the Philippines. Brady's deportation occurred around the same time as Oswald's leaflet distribution episode. As you point out, there were several, but the most publicized was the one in uh, in August with the international trademark. So that's probably that one. And Fraser thinks there may be some connection. Well, that may or may not be true, but he thinks so. He goes on to say, Frazier said, I think that Brady was deported because the CIA wanted him out of town. I don't know what that means. Brady and Ross Buckley, probably related to some activity with Cubans or something, the founders of Citizens for Free Cuba, used to hold press conferences and release statements denouncing President Kennedy for his Cuban policy. It's been no group. Jack, uh, this has all been called to... Uh, uh, Jose's attention, so I can just scan it. Uh, Burnside may be a, a lead to Thornley. Knew him quite well. Uh, Arnold Eklund uh, knows some of the people. Fraser also mentioned the man, Bernie Goldsmith, who was supposed to have made a statement that he saw Lee Oswald and Kerry Thornley together, or Thornley had mentioned that Oswald was in town. Goldsmith knows William Brady very well and now works at Tulane University. That's worth checking out, but that's been called uh, Jose's attention, so I guess it was followed through. I can look at specifics of it. 
Okay, that's take care of that one. Now we'll go to the interview. Next one I'm going to show you how we contact you. Yeah. Next, we'll take a look at Daphne Stapleman. Um, while I'm getting some coffee, just start reading in the third, just start reading in the third paragraph while I get some coffee. Daphne Stapleman told me. Andrew Samba, one of our top investigators. Is Daphne Stapleton told me that she met Lee Harvey Oswald one time. She said she was standing in front of the Ryder Coffee House when Lee Harvey Oswald walked up to her and asked, Where's the Jack here? She said the Jack that Lee Harvey Oswald was referring to was Jack Fraser. She told Oswald that Fraser was not around the time but would probably be back later on. She said that Oswald then wrote his name on a piece of paper and said to give the paper to Jack. She said she took the paper, read the name, which was Lee Oswald, and she put the paper and book that she had in her hand. I'm reading the Daphne Stapleton thing, but I think you're familiar with the Ryder Coffee House thing. You can make your own notes to follow up. Okay. She said she either gave the paper to Jack Frazier when he came back, or she merely told him that Oswald was looking for him. She said that after she told Oswald that Frazier was not around, he walked past her and went to Howard Cohen's apartment. Evidently, Cohen was not in because a short while later, Oswald passed her on the steps as he was coming back from Cohen's apartment. Oswald stopped and helped her catch a little cat which he got away from her. Daphne said as best as she can remember, A woman drove Oswald up to the Ryder Coffee House. An elderly woman with gray hair in her forties. Um, let's see what else. Again, the minor shows that come to suffer. Maybe again because we're reading it again. After the assassination, shows her left for Florida and told Daphne not to talk to anyone about Lee Harvey Oswald. Here are some names in the second paragraph on the second page of Rail J. feel very strongly that Cowan would have a lot of information about Lee Harvey Oswald. Now make a note for you to check out when you talk to Jack Frazier. I haven't had a chance to check it out, but I came across it just in some things on the side. That Cowan and Jack Frazier, I think it was right after the assassination, but it's rather odd. I think he spells it C-O-H-E-N anyway, but he made a trip to Mexico with Jack Frazier, which Jack Frazier never mentioned to us. Uh, oh, it was, it was in, in 63 sometime. Frazier and Cohen, C-O-H-E-N, made a trip to Mexico in 63. And uh, I can't remember the details, but... Uh, Notice going back to Fraser's statements that he had never mentioned. So it might be worth, it might be productive somewhere. I asked uh, too many people going to Mexico in '63. Not only Oswald, but, but even Don Lee Mitchell. I asked Daphne what information she gave to uh, Dave Snyder of the state side, and she said, not much. She said Snyder told her that he wanted to talk to her because the state side was going to prove the garrison did not have a case and all against him was a witch hunt. Concluding line, it is interesting to recall Tommy Bomber's remark to Barbara Reed that if the DA's office wants to find out about Lee Harvey Oswald, they should look into his activities around the right at the coffee house. The only significance about Tommy Bomber is he's another uh, character. He became a lawyer eventually who hung around the Bannister uh, office uh, for a little while. He saw a few things. Doesn't seem to have been too significant, but uh, anyway, we're still on the writer at the coffee house. There's an interview by James Alcock, who was my chief assistant to somewhere about that time, shortly after, to a guy named Robert Cono, whose name is on the list of visit us to ride a coffee house. Now, I don't have
have this underlined, uh, the underlining didn't come through clearly, but halfway down the page, Robert Carno uh, corroborates uh, Daphne Stapleton in effect, and with regard to Oswald being at the Royal Crossing House. I'll talk. Now let me ask you this. Did you ever meet Oswald here in the city? Well, I believe I did, and I'm almost, almost sure I did twice. Alcott, do you want to tell me about the occasions and the persons you think or thought was Oswald? Once at the Ryder, Co Ryder Coffee House on Rampart Street, 700 block of Rampart. <coughs> and that was the last little, in the last part of the summer or September of 1963. What makes you think it was Oswald? I was considering myself at the time a writer, and I was talking to a lot of people, and they did mention that his name was Lee, and I thought I remembered it was Oswald. The last thing. When you saw the pictures after the assassination, did it recall? Not right away, I'd say the second day it did. Now, the meeting you had with the right across the house, was that the first meeting or the second? It was the first. Do you recall what you were doing? Well, anyway, that, it could go on, you can read the rest later on if you were leisure, but on page three, it, uh, he mentions that the bartender at the place by the coffee house was Jack Frazier. And uh, then on page four, which confirms that he did it in D.C. Oswald in terms of probability, on page one, you'll notice he seems to be a little cautious, but I think that's a case of an honest witness just being careful, because now he's asked about the second time he saw Oswald. Well, you say you mentioned, you mentioned his name was Lee, and uh, you feel he might have said Oswald, something like that, because I met him later. Where did you meet him later? At the public library. <coughs> where? Napoleon and Magazine. That's the one where Oswald went frequently because it was just around uh, a few blocks away from where he lived. So let's see if there's anything else there that since they're not the operation of Stapleton. It's only, and here's the fellow. Page 14. Yeah, page 14. Remember, the whole point of the Ryder, Ryder Coffee House is, is a situation that uh, puts Gary Thornley and Lee Oswald uh, as visitors to this odd little place. Uh, Oswald is time had been there. Now, we know Thornley's been there, but he also. You know, Kerry Thornley, I thought you'd bring that up. I've met him twice. Where did you meet him? Once. Now, the first time I may not be sure of. I thought I met him once before at the Bourbon House with Roger Lovin, because I thought he introduced me to him, because at the time he was writing something. Now, this had to be in 63 or 64, probably 63. Yeah, it would definitely be in 63, blah, blah, blah. Um, and a little down here, he says about more. Uh, oh, yeah. Thornley comes over to his house. This is interesting. Thornley comes over. He came over to my house for something else to find out if I had ever met him before. This is very much like David Ferry after the assassination going to neighbors of Oswald's and asking them if they ever saw Oswald's, or the library card Oswald was using, whose name was on it. Thornley comes over after the assassination. Um, just a few weeks ago, as a matter of fact, it's in 1968. Thornley comes over to Carno's house it's in 1968. He came over to your house uh, to, to find out if, if he'd ever met him somewhere before. Yeah. Alone? No, with Slim Brooks. He asked you if you had met him before? Carno. Yeah. And I thought I had at first. Now I'm kind of confused if I did meet him at the Bourbon House, but I think I did because if this is the same person, he had a briefcase and he was writing something. At the same time, I was also we discussed poetry and writing stories and that stuff. That's the uh, essence of the uh, thing. the main point of the writer Coffee House is. It's another apparent connection, although a light one, between Thornley and Oswald. And of course, you know the thrust of Thornley's testimony before the Warren Commission is that 
he didn't even know Oswald was, uh, was in this part of town. So that's where I've got a stack of stuff related to Tony on the floor, but that ends. Six, seven, seven. Mm -hmm. Only this show in September 
Bill Craig, I don't know who he is, Bill Dalzell, Grady Durham, who has some kind of intelligence connection with the government because uh, uh, he incorporated Bannister's private detective agency after he made his phony break with the uh, police. He no Bannister's background, World War II, he was ONI, later he's, he's head of the Chicago FBI office. And when he does go into the role of private detective, which we know he wasn't from his files, Grady Durham incorporates it. Grady Durham, parenthetically, when they, he absconds with a substantial amount of his client's money, uh, instead of, uh, instead of uh, being disbarred, is uh, protected by the National Guard officer that I knew casually from the Guard, the lieutenant colonel is called, and suddenly called to active duty in order to Washington, which is, I presume has the effect of insulating him from immediate um, legal action. And meanwhile, negotiations were worked out with my office, and when all the people who lost money were paid off, we dropped charges. And about a year later, when I went to Washington and checked the phone book out of curiosity, I found listed in the Washington phone book Lieutenant Colonel Grady Durham, still on active duty. So he had friends in Washington, like so many of the people we encountered. He was part of the group, and an individual named Logan, who was also a member of the CIA, <coughs> Bill Klein, an attorney, Regis Kennedy, a member of the FBI, and whom you know by now is uh, the FBI's contact uh, with the Cuban group. He's, uh, they probably literally had a Cuban desk, um, and uh, Regis Kennedy and apparently Warren DeVries were operating a Cuban desk. DeBree seems to have been the primary contact with Oswald. Regis Kennedy with uh, individuals like uh, uh, characters with the Cuban structure and bring Weir from time to time talking to one or the other. She said that although Dalzell uh, bring Weir uh, being the local top representative of the DRE, the uh, a Cuban group, which is very rabid, extremely rabid, and uh, undoubtedly among those supported by the uh, that part of the American intelligence community, which is interested in doing something about Castro. She said that although, although Dalzell was very secretive about the operation of the group, that from the conversations she overheard over a period of time, she learned that the group was involved in an undercover operation in, in conjunction with the CIA and FBI, which involved the shipment and transportation of individuals and supplies in and out of Cuba. She said that many times Regis Kennedy would come over to the house and talk to Dalzell concerning the operation. She also said that what the FBI is obviously doing is uh, there's no attempt to, in any way to, to indicate that they're part of the operation. I think uh, any anybody who's been familiar with the FBI would see that they're monitoring it, so to speak. It would be what they would do. And they're monitoring a CIA-backed operation. Beings are not against it, they're probably in favor of it, but they just want to know what's happening. She also said that many times Regis Kennedy came to the office in the Balkan building to talk to Dalzell, who seems to be, uh, by that time, a contract employee of the CIA. In fact, later on, he is in international travels taken to North Africa. In turn, Dalzell and other members of the group visited Regis Kennedy in his office. She said that Regis Kennedy confirmed to her the fact that Clay Shaw is a former CIA agent who did some work for the CIA in Italy over a five-year span. I'll tell you how strong Regis Kennedy is in this in this whole picture. He was a career FBI agent, one of the older agents, and because he obviously knew so much about what uh, was happening it was in the middle of everything, we called him before the grand jury. Uh, we're investigating the assassination of the president, which we call this FBI agent who's in the middle of that the Cuban banister operation to ask him some questions. You know, like what Ring Ware's real function was with the CIA, to what extent was the CIA backing the, the uh, revolutionary Cuban front, things that he would have to know. He took the executive privilege in every instance. Uh, we could have I'm sure brought him into court like the federal government does. We got the judge to order him to answer. But by that time, it was apparent the name of the game was power. It was predictable that there would have been an injunction coming from the federal court. 
and they would have been rescued by the federal court, so we didn't spin our wheels. The grand jury? This wasn't a grand jury. In Orleans Parish grand jury. They wanted uh, Regis Kennedy to, to tell us more about the, the CIA support, of, uh, to what extent Greenberg was connected with them, to what extent they were financing and backing uh, the Cuban Revolutionary Front. Do you have a list of those questions? Well, we got the uh, we got the sure. trial transcript of Reed Kennedy taking executive privilege on whatever question he did there, but we haven't gotten the grand jury stuff yet. That's available. To right, but I mean, the grand jury, when you realize that he was asked questions, you continue to keep asking them questions. I asked him a number of critical questions, and it would be meaningful. I, I see what you mean. Right. That's what you would see, you would see the FBI agent that had to know about the Bannister operation, that had liaison with everybody there, being asked by the district attorney and taking the executive, I must have asked him many questions. And by the time the trial came, I think I just asked a few, and when it became obvious, he called it Washington each time, I made my point. But when the time comes, you're able to get the transcript, uh, you can, you would include that aspect, you include the transcript of uh, the testimony of Regis Kennedy. He was recalled in 67, or, uh, or early 68, but that's it's probably by 67. And grand, and grand jury transcripts in Louisiana, at least in New Orleans, are automatically typed up. It's not like trial testimony. In the case of trial testimony, most of it is usually not typed until there's an appeal. In this case, most of it was typed. But the grand jury testimony is, uh, is automatic, so they have it typed up somewhere. And you will see him ask critical questions, and as he indicates, on instructions from the Justice Department, in effect, some words to that effect, he's taking the executive privilege. So, already, it's become apparent that the FBI is on the other side. As for Regis Kennedy confirming the fact that Clay Shaw is a former CIA agent who did some work for the CIA in Italy, uh, we have uh, substantial material available on that, but right now that's an area that uh, you all don't care that much about. You've got other priorities. If you're successful and you survive next year, that's the kind of thing you can be digging into. And uh, I can go into that with you. She said this group later moved from their office in the Balta building. And I might add that that just indicates, what that does indicate, though, is about Clay Shaw, that, that uh, sojourn in Italy where he was, uh, as we learned from the Italian newspapers, which published the details before the assassination, before he became famous in 62 indicate that Clay Shaw is probably employed on a very high level because he was on the board of directors of the Central, Central Mondo Commercial, which means the World Trade Center. But as the Italian newspapers discovered and the Italian government discovered, it was a device for funneling large sums of money to the Italian fascist parties so that they could put down and be successful in their, their uh, uh, political fights of the government positions against more radical groups. In other words, that was a, a, an extension of the, the foreign policy, you might say, of the CIA. But it indicates that, our, that Shaw is at a rather high level uh, if he's uh, on the board of directors of an operation like that. So that explains why he is so discreet. When a time comes, like when you read Bundy's testimony to Powell and other things, you will see that Shaw is particularly discreet she said that she does not know whether or not Clay Shaw had any connection with this group. She does not remember hearing Clay Shaw's name mentioned, she means in any other way. She said that Bill Dalzell could tell us everything about the group and about the connection with Regis Kennedy and the CIA. She said Dalzell has open charge against him in New York, which she believes is, is gun theft. And Joe Bolden has the entire file on Dalzell. Well, Bolden does, but you've got enough record on Dalzell that his past doesn't make any difference. It's what he was doing in the early 60s and what he can tell us now. She said that for some reason she's heard Bill Dalzell's name mentioned quite often since the investigation started. She said that approximately two weeks ago, this is uh, March 67, about, about two weeks ago he made a trip into New Orleans and spoke to Stephen Plotkin and heard, she heard he left town since. She said that the, she believes he is somewhere in Texas, but Plotkin could give us the address. She doesn't know it herself. She said we might also be interested in tape recording involving Dalzell, Jack Martin, and Grady Durham in regard to 
theft of money. She said she handed that tape over to Persian Gervais, who in turn handed it over to the district attorney's office. I'm not sure, but I think by that time I had fired Persian Gervais. Or because I found out he received a seven hundred and fifty dollar payoff to somebody. Fired him the next day. But uh here's uh second uh, parent interview by Shambra. And then I don't know why I'm so thirsty. Do we have any more coffee left? Sure. Let me get you some, Jim. Okay. Keep, keep doing. I'm thirsty because I'm, uh, I'm talking. <coughs> Is this stuff interesting to you? I mean, it gives you an no overview. Yeah, exactly. Okay, that's, that's, that's her function. We don't present her as a, as a person who was in Bannister's office and so forth, but uh, it's informational background which is, uh, if it ain't evidence, it's just uh, sometimes a half a step away. Uh, yeah, and it enables you to recognize evidence when you see it. I talked with, um, you know, we got some codes, every you see a code every now and then. We had so many different codes, sometimes we don't know what we're talking about. It. Now Betty Parrott, Andrew has suddenly become very coy in his interview with BP. <laughs> the same fucking file. <laughs> for Betty Parrott interview, and then now it's with BP. This is a confusing federal agent. It's probably worse. It's probably worse. Especially when you're calling it up right behind it. <laughs> it's probably throwing them off. I talked with BP. Oh, I think that BS is beautiful for Tony. That's, that's going to be his permanent. I talked with BP in reference to her knowledge concerning the Friends of Democratic Cuba and showed her the letter which we received in the mail, apparently an anonymous letter. I can't remember. Uh, what was the, a few days back, what were those anonymous? Oh, yeah, we got some anonymous letters which were very informational about uh, Beckham. Uh, but that's it. We'll go into that later. Talk a little when we talk about the old churches. BP informed me she'd only been to the office in the Baltimore building three or four times, but she remembers a few of the people who were in the organization. That she definitely remembers Joseph Moore. Um, Let's get Joe Moore, because uh, while the name shows up, well, he was honorably discharged from the Marine Corps two months after World War II, late 20s, blonde hair, blue eyes, 5'8", 150, 160. We don't know who that is. Was See, it the name Joe Moore given? The name Joe was used, Moore was used at Bolton Ford. Right. But that was a heavy set last fellow using the name Joe Moore. Right. But it's interesting, just like they're using the name for the guy who's not Oswald, as he can be, they're also coming up with a name. So they're using the names of people they know. I think Joe Moore was killed by that time, if I remember. Yeah, she's under the impression that, uh, that uh, I'll get to that. Uh, she said she, he, he came, Moore came into town in the same week in which Bill Dalzell formed the Friends of Democratic Cuba and opened the office in the Balta building. She said this was around late November or December of 60. She said Moore was from the U.S. and not from Lima. Peru, and that she only heard speak English. BP said that the person who wrote the letter may have gotten his address mixed up because one of Moore's associates was Dalzell, and Dalzell had a partner in some kind of deal in Lima. BP said Moore did not have any friends in particular. Whenever she saw him, he was with Dalzell or Akacha. Dalzell seems to have connected with Akacha more and more. BP said she's pretty certain that Moore, who was a paratrooper in the Marine Corps, took part in the Bay of Pigs invasion, and she is under the impression that he was killed. So if he was killed in 61, uh, yeah, but that but the Bay of Pigs is, is in April '61, and uh, and uh, Bolton Ford is uh, several months before that, so he probably wasn't killed at that time. He just probably wasn't around. She said that when Moore left New Orleans by uh, Bolton Ford time, he was probably trained in Guatemala. She said that when Moore left New Orleans, he went straight to Miami, Florida. She does not know where he lived in town, but our touch and Dalzell got him a room somewhere around the office. I uh, jump to the next paragraph. BP said that Guy Bannister had files on all the people around the office at the time. Well, we found out that's essentially true. That Logan was a CIA man assigned to Arcacha and the Friends of Democratic Cuba, and his counterpart from the FBI was Regis Kennedy. That's a good way to put it. She said that Logan was good friends with Grady Durham, and that both of them belonged to the chess club around the Maritime Building. She said all members of the group were screened by the FBI and CIA. That'd be interesting to ask Durham. Uh, he might, uh, for example, he might 
be willing to give you that. Uh, you might not be willing to say you were employed the, by the agency. You might have had to sign that contract they have. On the other hand, uh, perhaps uh, you will say, well, whether the CIA screened some of these ca characters. BP said Logan was tall, distinguished, had dark hair, and worked out in New Orleans office. She said she knew of no calm boy head. We should check into the waiters who worked in the court of two sisters during the summer of 1963. As she's heard, at least one of the waiters had said Lee Harvey Oswald stayed in one of the upstairs apartments at the court. She said Pete Marcel had something to do with the court, and she'd heard that Oswald stayed there, and so forth and so on. And then that gets into Gene Davis, who's awfully marginal, not worth wasting time on now. Most of this you can read uh, yourself. She said there only 15 to 20 people in the Friends of Democratic Cuba, and uh, she might recognize some pictures that could not call me by name. She said Bannister was around there. Uh, later on, much later, that Cubans uh, hang around Bannister's office, but this time Bannister's around there, mostly with Grady Durham. Uh, who we see had some kind of uh, unusual federal connections. Um, Bannister by now has made his um, patented uh, intelligence departure from uh, the police force in Dalzell, who appears to be uh, working for the government too by this time. BP said Tiger Jim, whoever that is, could be Jim Poole. We, we didn't encounter Tiger Jim. She said when Dalzell formed the FDC, Friends of Democratic Cuba, in the late 60s, that means late 50s, I'm sure, uh, obviously. Uh, he was staying in a hotel which is now the John Mitchell, but that's still there. Dalzell spent a lot of time in Peru on a deal which never materialized. Uh, she said Ed Butler didn't know a lot about the FTC as he was always with Guy Bannister and Jack Martin. Ed Butler is with the Ed Butler is 100 percent agency. He does not work. He dresses expensively. He describes himself as a conflict manager. He's the one who had the debate with Oswald brings forth added on WDSU, and uh, within, I think, five days, he's in Congress playing it before committees of Congress. He's, uh, he's a kind of cool hustler. He formed Inca Information Council of America. He's got a lot of wealthy men to put their names on the letterhead. Nobody I have heard of yet has ever heard of a single broadcast down there anti-communist broadcast going down to South America, but that's the idea. But so you have a, an organization in existence now which has a kind of uh, a patriotic look. So when uh, Inca later uh, prints records of the debate of this Marxist with Ed Butler, and he goes out and promotes it well, they've got uh, more machinery discrediting Oswald than that. Let's see what we have next. Let's see what I have. We have um, Mrs. Mary Bannister would be a good one to go to next just to kind of get to some of the more fundamental ones. The, the, Mrs., the most interesting part would be Mrs. Bannister, she's telling Shamba, said that the one or two days after her husband's death, she did go into his office to prevent anyone from taking his files, and discovered some files had already been taken. She said the only thing she could say in regard to this was this. So Bannister's office finds that it was left yet. She said the only thing she could say in regard to Oswald's Fair Play for Cuba committee was that she saw some Fair Play for Cuba leaflets in Bannister's office when she went there after his death. That's the... Mrs. Bannister said she threw them away in a wastebasket. Mrs. Bannister told me that because she was in such financial difficulty, she sold many of her husband's files to the Metropolitan Crime Commission, she gave some to the State Sovereignty Commission. <coughs> what a laugh that must have been. I don't know if that still in existence, the State Sovereignty Commission.
state sovereignty commission, uh, as I would call it roughly, the, the basic idea is to keep blacks from walking down white streets like Royal Street. That's, 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 Huh? I don't. I don't even think. I don't even think they exist anymore. I, you know, by the time uh, uh, they started uh, losing the critical fights, uh, that part of the this part of the nineteenth century was still left over. And she gave some to the state police. Maybe worth checking with them, as, as you as you know, LJ, because they may have actually some final stuff away. Otherwise, Mrs. Bannister. There's nothing substantial uh, to offer. Uh, having uh, made the point, uh, well, let's take a look at Nitschke. Get the Nitschke? Yeah. Nitschke, Cliff, gives a little more <coughs> insight into what's happening in the Bannister office. He was in the FBI with Bannister, not always at the same station, but over the same years. He arrives in uh, New Orleans in late 1961 and recalls that on one occasion, possibly the early part of December 61, when he returned to Bannister's office, there were several male persons there engaged in a conference with Bannister. This is uh, after the Bay of Pigs, but uh, by that time there's a structure which seems to have remained uh, more or less alive uh, to support the, the raids against Cuba, even though the April invasion attempt at the Bay of Pigs in 1961 was unsuccessful. For several years afterwards, as you know, the CIA followed the policy, organized policy, of strikes, uh, they call them on the mainland. And the training camps for these strikes uh, definitely were in Florida and uh, uh, appear to have been at least in two instances in, in Louisiana, north of Lake Pontchartrain. That's, that's important to keep in mind because it helps to understand one of the reasons this substructure continues to be in existence, continues to be in existence in 1961 and 1962, as well as 63 prior to the assassination. It's a reason for its existence several years before the assassination. It's like uh, in, in Dallas, is the second reason for the existence of the increase. When I returned to Bannister's office, there were several male persons then engaged in a conference with Bannister. Subsequently, I was invited.